Um, hi, everybody, and welcome. My name is Paula Price. I am an executive coach for lawyers, and I'm really excited to be presenting to you today. This webinar is called the Summer Student Bootcamp. It's six steps to succeed in your first law firm job. And I'm very excited to have you here today with me. Um, I see I have, uh, uh, now I'll be getting to the chat. Hi everybody, somebody coming in from Montreal. It's a, it's a pleasure to see you. Um, so you know that you're in the right place if number one, you are a law student. And what you want is to learn more about what it's like to work at a law firm. You want to know what to expect and what you can do to thrive in that environment. Effectively, what you're looking for is to become a sort of a go-to student. Um, when you are going to your first law job, I mean, you might feel any number of things. You're probably really excited about getting into your first position and what that's going to involve. You may also find that you're a little bit nervous about it. Uh, you may not have worked in an office environment before. You may not know how to do things like get work assignments. Um, you may not know how to communicate in a way that is comfortable or professional with the lawyers in your firm. So there's a lot of questions that students have. And the purpose of today's webinar is for me to walk you through um, six common challenges that I see among students and also young lawyers, and to give you some tips for, um, for, for learning how to overcome those challenges. So in today's webinar, we have about 60 minutes together. I'm going to be introducing you to those six practices that I just mentioned. And throughout, I'm going to be encouraging you to use your chat. I'm also going to encourage you to ask questions. So while I'm doing a Zoom presentation with my screen share on, which I'm doing today, I cannot see the chat, um, sorry, I cannot see the Q&A. So what I would invite you to do, you can see the, the Q&A, is as you have questions, feel free to put those in the Q&A. And if you see questions that other students are asking that you like, then I would encourage you to upvote those questions because when we turn to the Q&A portion at the end of today's webinar, I'll be turning to the most upvoted questions first. Now with the chat, I can see that. I will be asking you questions as you go through. Um, I would encourage you to put the questions into the Q&A, but if they come up in the chat, I will try to deal with them as we go through our content for today's webinar. So going back to what you will learn today, um, we are going to be talking about six common challenges that students face when they start working at a law firm. We're going to be talking about a framework that you can use to address and overcome those challenges. And I'm also going to be talking about an opportunity that I have for us to work together in relation to these areas. So um, that will be later in today's uh, webinar. If you're not interested, you don't have to stay on for that part, but I would um, love to share it with you. So um, let's not waste any time. We're gonna jump into the six challenges. So here they are. Um, these are challenges that I identified based on my own experience as a student many years ago, my experience as a lawyer working with students who were going through that process. And now my experience as a coach, I work with lawyers, I work with students, and I help them um, basically thrive in their practice. And that of course looks different depending on what stage you're at. Um, the six challenges that I think are the most common are number one, understanding expectations and setting your own professional goals. The second is uh, building relationships. Um, and sorry, I'll, I'll go back to that for a moment. When it comes to setting goals, I think the challenge that, this, that, that young lawyers often have is number one, understanding what the expectations are of them in practice. And the other side of that is not necessarily setting for themselves goals that align with what they're trying to accomplish. And this is a problem that I see not just among students who are starting out at their first job, but also lawyers all throughout their career. And it's very common in lawyers who have been practicing for a few years where they've not necessarily done the um, sort of the questioning of what they're truly interested in pursuing. And they reach a bit of a, of a crossroads where they realize that, um, that they're not interested, that they don't like the, the work that they're doing. And so my um, mission here is to really encourage students to start thinking about this question from the outset 
So you may not be planning out your entire career. You may be planning in terms of weeks or months, but what you're doing is you're developing the muscle of, of setting your goals and achieving them. And that is a much more proactive way of approaching your legal career than letting others tell you or just sort of falling into what is available to you. Um, so the second piece is building relationships. And I see young lawyers especially struggle with this, particularly now that we are in a pandemic and many lawyers are and law firms are operating a lot more in a virtual context. So lawyers, students have questions about how they can communicate with others, particularly in this, in this environment. So that's another area that we'll talk about. Third is managing your time. And I am a time management junkie. I love time management. Um, it's a topic that I could speak forever about. I, I presented earlier this week with uh, a fellow coach. It was a two-hour presentation for a very large organization with a broad range of attendees, senior lawyers, junior lawyers, support staff. Um, there are about 200 people in attendance. And we covered a lot um, in two hours and we still could have gone on for longer. So I will touch on it a little bit today, but that is an area where a lot of lawyers struggle, um, particularly at the beginning, but it's a, it, for some lawyers, that's something that carries on with them through their practice. So it's really great if you can get on top of your time management, your timekeeping at, at the outset. Um, another challenge that students often have is practical writing. And so it's that transition from writing in an academic environment and looking at what's rewarded in that setting versus what is practical and most useful in a law practice. So that is something that we're going to be talking about today as well. The fifth challenge is effective speaking. Uh, this is an area that I think many of us, we can always be improving our, our, our speaking skills, it comes in a lot for young lawyers, uh, especially if you're like me, if you're a little bit shy, a little bit reserved, um, if you tend to turn red as I do, it can be a bit daunting. And so we're going to talk about some tools and strategies you can use to overcome that. And then finally, feedback. And feedback is an area where I think a lot of us, particularly a lot of lawyers, a lot of young lawyers, aren't necessarily feeling like they're getting a lot of feedback. And so there's ways that you can deal with that. There's also some tools that you can use when it comes to processing feedback. And I'm excited to talk more about that as well. And if you're looking at my slide deck and wondering why there's a Fortnite emote uh, on the screen, it's inspired by my children. They're both uh, kind of obsessed with Fortnite, which hopefully doesn't say too much about my skills as a parent. But um, it's a little bit like a video game. Uh, when we are learning something new, when we are faced with these new challenges, it's an opportunity just to learn and grow. And yes, sometimes you're going to be on that level of a video game and you're just not going to be able to make it to the next one. That's normal. That's part of your learning experience. But with each challenge that you have, you develop stronger, you get new strategies. And the goal here is for you to overcome those challenges um, so that you can get to that next level recognizing that with every new level, there are going to be new challenges. And that is really part of the growth. That's part of the excitement. So with that being said, we're going to step into the first section, which is understanding expectations and setting goals. Here, um, there is, um, you know, the challenges that students often face is they don't know what to expect. They've maybe never worked in an office before. And they may not understand that there are certain rules at play within their organization. They may be explicit rules. So you may have an extensive onboarding period where you have lawyers and uh, members of the professional development team who are sharing with you what is expected of you, what the dress code is, what the policies are in relation to billable expectations in terms of the work that you do but you may not have all those things, or you may have extensive onboarding, but you still have questions. Um, it may also be, as I mentioned earlier, that you don't have a strategy for your own professional growth. Um, and what you may find, or what some students find, is that the strategies that they apply to be successful students aren't necessarily the same strategies that will make them successful lawyers. And where this comes up particularly is when you're a student, you all are in roughly a similar program. The 
way that you are measured is usually pretty explicit. If it's a question of grades, you know what that means. There's, there's some clear indicators and there's, there's a lot of structure already in place. And when you move into a law firm environment, there will be structure, there will be some structure and the level of structure depends on the firm that you've joined. But the biggest difference is that now you are really accountable for yourself and you may be working on a project that is completely different from the projects that other students are working on. So there's no longer that uniform, one size fits all, you all write the same test or you write your exam at the same time, or you write your paper at the same time. It really is a much more individual experience. And so that can take a lot of getting used to. What makes for um, success or where you want to go as a student is you really want to be in a position where you understand what the rules are, what the expectations are. Um, you want to understand how to navigate what those expectations are. And you also want to have a clear strategy for your professional growth and how you're going to adapt to that professional versus the academic setting. And this is a balance that you're going to need to strike, balancing the expectations that the firm has of you with your own professional goals. And Ideally, these are all in alignment, but you may find yourself having to, um, and they may all be in alignment, but you may find yourself having to seek out those opportunities to create the kind of professional development that you want for yourself. Uh, things that you'll want to learn as a student. And uh, sorry, I, I forgot to mention earlier that I would encourage you to have a notepad handy and to be taking notes as we go through, because Number one, I'm giving you a framework that you can use. Uh, if you like it, you can use it. If you don't think it's helpful for you, you can always modify it or come up with your own framework. But what I would really encourage you to do as we go through this lesson today is to take notes in terms of what you think is going to be most useful to you. So, um, so, so when it comes to you starting at your job, starting at your next job you're, you're within your law firm, some of the things that you might want to think about is to learn how to set goals for yourself. So what does that look like to you? What does that process look like? What are the things that you're seeking to achieve? Uh, you'll wanna set goals that push you out of your comfort zone. That of course is part of growth. You'll want to learn how to track your progress and you'll want to know how to stay motivated towards your goals. You're also uh, going back to the expectations. You're also really going to, going to want to understand what the expectations are within your law firm. So that's understanding what professionalism means in the context of your particular firm. You want to develop your so-called soft skills and we'll be talking about those quite a bit in today's webinar. And you really want as much as possible to set yourself up to hit the ground running. So the more you can do that work before your first day, um, that idea of forecasting what it is that you seek to achieve, especially I mean, if you're looking at a summer position, what is it you're seeking to achieve over the course of the summer, getting really particular. And I think the, the, the work that we're doing today, the framework that we're going to be talking about, will give you some ideas about where you might be setting some of your goals. So before we move into the next section, I'm just going to ask um, in the chat if anybody would like to post some of the chats that they, some of the comments that they might have, some of the goals they might have for their summer experience. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll continue to move on, and as the chat comes through, I will, I will read those back to you. Um, I just wanted to note again, I won't be reading anybody's names out. I understand some people want to keep their um, questions and comments confidential, so I don't want to mix up, um, mix that up. Oh, here we have, this is wonderful. I have a comment coming in, learn how to bill hours and how much time I should be spending on different tasks. Okay, that's excellent. Um, and we're gonna be talking about billing and, and time on tasks in, in, a, in a later section. So thank you for that. A goal of mine is to feel comfortable in a professional environment, 100%. So that is really what we're talking about here today is to have that framework in place so that you can create a, a plan for yourself that will allow you to feel the most comfortable. Um, another goal came in, uh, get a sense of new practice areas, how to ask for help, make connections to mentors. This is really amazing. Um, this is exactly what we're gonna be talking about in terms of building relationships and, um, and communication. Asking for help, I think is one of those key pieces that often is not done. I think a lot of students and young lawyers feel like if they ask a question, it's a signal that they're not smart. And 
Unfortunately, that means that they may resist asking a question when doing so could lead them to clarification on an assignment that can really make a difference in the outcome. So I'm so glad that you raised that. How to ask for help is a key tool that we all need to work on. And we'll talk about that a little bit actually in this next section. So thank you everybody for setting out some of these goals here. I think those are really excellent goals and thank you for sharing them. Um, the next piece in the framework is this piece about relationships. And on the one hand, when you're in a law firm, the there is so much emphasis on the quality of the work that you do. And of course, that really is paramount. You're really wanting to, um, you know, the, the, the work that the law firm does is all in service of creating outcomes for your client. And, um, and, and within the organization itself, you are now working in a web of people and there are lots of different players within the context of a law firm. So you've got lawyers of all different levels. You've got the senior lawyers, you've got sort of the, the mid-level, you've got other students. There is a team of staff to support the lawyers in their work. So there's legal assistance, there are paralegals, there's IT support. Um, there are members of the firm who are devoted to professional development of lawyers. There are members of the organization, depending on how large your law firm is. There is an HR component. There's an accounting component. You know, there's a marketing component. They're all different. And if I'm forgetting a, a, a group, uh, forgive me. Um, but what I'm trying to illustrate here is that there are a number of different actors and your job as a student is to figure out where you're going to situate yourself within the, um, within the ecosystem of the law firm. So some of the things that you may find challenging as you enter into a law firm is, you know, you just want to make everybody happy. You want to get along with everybody. You may not really know where you fit in. So that might be a, a challenge. You may want to create meaningful connections with people, but you don't really know how to go about it. And this is particularly so in the context of the pandemic. Um, some of the feedback that I've heard from law students, from young lawyers, from uh, more senior lawyers even, is that there are fewer opportunities for the organic relationships to, for relationships to grow organically. So one lawyer uh, gave the example of conference calls and she told me that she used to bring students or young lawyers in as a matter of course, anytime that she had a call with a client, it was just a matter of you know picking up the person from their office and bringing them into her office. With COVID, this is no longer possible because uh, at least at the time, it may have changed now depending on how the office is set up, but, um, but including somebody in a conference call of that nature would require extending an additional virtual invitation. It maybe raised some questions about, do we bill for this, do we not? And it just became, uh, there was now an, a, a hurdle between having the person, um, a hurdle to have that person join in the call. So it really is a, a it is a reality. And uh, I would encourage all of you as you're starting out in your law firms to take it upon yourself to really insert yourself, to really create those opportunities for connection for yourself because they may not be there uh, organically. And the lawyers that you're working with uh, most likely are not not including you on purpose, but it may just be that they are already busy, they already have a lot on their plates, and so they just may not think about it. So if you can do that legwork for them and create those opportunities, that's wonderful. I encourage you to do that. Um, another piece here is learning how to communicate effectively. So it might be new, right? Communicating in an environment that is a law firm is maybe quite different from what you're used to. And people within law firms have different communication styles. So some lawyers that you speak with, for example, may be very go, 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 you know, we've got to move fast. There are maybe other lawyers who want to take a little bit more time with you, who want to approach the problem from different perspectives. And as a student, your job is to look at what the different communication styles are and really tailor the messaging, the way that you speak, the way you interact, with the different lawyers that you're working with, with the different members of the firm that you're working with. Um, another element of um, to consider here is also creating an internal market for your work. And as you build relationships, um, one of the key areas where you're going to want to build relationships is with the lawyers who, who you want to build relationships with your clients. 
and I use quotation marks because your clients are going to evolve as you evolve as a lawyer. When you first start out, your clients are other lawyers. And as your practice evolves, your, your clients become what we might consider true clients, the clients who are uh, non-lawyers who are seeking the services of a law firm. So you'll want to think about how to create an internal market for your work. So what do you need to be doing with lawyers that you work with that has them coming back? And this is where the um, communication piece is so key. This is where you want to be able to have discussions about what the nature of the work product is that they're seeking. You're going to want to have conversations about how much time you should be spending on a certain task. You're going to want to have conversations about whether you need to renegotiate a timeline. And we'll get to that a little bit more in the time management piece, but, um, but this is all really important. And before we move on, I also wanted to highlight that when you're in the context of a law firm and you're thinking about your relationships, one space where there's room for opportunity, there's growth, is to be intentional about the relationships that you're forming. So one of the comments was about developing mentoring relationships, and that's key to your growth as a lawyer. And in some firms, you might get assigned a mentor, and maybe that's the perfect mentor for you. It may also be that the mentor that you're assigned just isn't an ideal match for you in relation to your personality, in relation to what you really want to achieve in your professional environment. And in, if that's the case, then I would encourage you to go and seek out mentors informally. And these may be mentors within your law firm. These may be mentors outside of your law firm. But the key piece here is for you to have an intentional um, pursuit, if you will, of the relationships that you want to have within your firm and outside of your firm. And there are different categories. There's mentors, there's friends, there's uh, colleagues that you work with. And we can explore that more. I, I do explore that more deeply um, in the course that I'll describe later. But for the purposes of today, I would ask yourself to think about what that might look like. And just while we're, we're, while we're on this, um, I do have a free on, online course or, or, or webinar, I suppose, that I did last summer called um, something like networking, virtual networking for lawyers. It's on my uh, YouTube channel. I'm happy to provide a link to that in, uh, I'll send you an email with a recording of today's webinar and you might watch that to give yourself some ideas about how you can approach networking within your law firm. So we're moving into time management next. Um, and, and so this is uh, another area that uh, I really, really find a lot of fun. Some of the challenges, sorry, I shouldn't put fun and challenges right next to each other, although it is, it is, um, it is learning, it is fun. Um, so, so the next piece is, is time management. And this is an area where lawyers at all stages can really struggle. Uh, when you're a student, the transition can be tricky because you're used to being in an environment where you're in an academic setting, the timelines are set out for you and um, you're basically being told what to do. You know what to produce. When you transition to a law firm environment, you may all of a sudden have three different lawyers who are assigning you work, the deadlines themselves may be running up against each other. You may find yourself in a situation where now you're just not able to meet the deadlines. And so you're going to have to find a way to make this work. Um, there's a whole number of pieces that come into play when you're learning how to manage your time. Um, and, and the goals here are, sorry, before I go into those, I uh, just wanted to highlight some of the other challenges that this can raise is for some students and for some lawyers, this can lead to a feeling of overwhelm. Uh, it can um, be really challenging, especially for new lawyers starting out to understand what the expectations are. You may think, well, this is normal. Um, I'm supposed to practice like this when in fact, maybe your firm doesn't want you to practice like that. Maybe they want, um, they, they don't want you to be overwhelmed. So there's um, a number of factors at play that may be different when you're first starting out as a lawyer. Um, the other thing that you're going to want to keep in mind, especially as you're starting out, is you're wanting to develop a relationship of trust with the lawyers who you work with. And part of developing trust, um, in my view, I think a really, uh, you know, a really simple, not necessarily easy, but a really simple way to build trust is to deliver your work on time when you say you're going to do it. And um, so it's important for you to develop the skills to do that. Um, what I, 
um, recommend uh, for students and, and some of the tools that I suggest you start to think about now, and chances are you've been developing a ton of these tools already to make your way through law school, to make your way through all the various commitments that you have, um, is number one, having a practice of planning your time. Uh, I love talking about planning. I'm a huge planner myself. And one of the, one of the key pieces behind the planning, and I'll, I, I can't help myself, but um, when you think about how you think, there are really two factors at play. There's the um, sort of the more evolved way of thinking, which I'll, I'll describe as, you know, the thinking with your prefrontal cortex, the front part of your brain, the part of your brain that's, that's, that's involved in executive functioning, decision-making, planning, forward thought. And then there's this other part of your brain in the back called the amygdala, which is more responsible for what people describe as the fight or flight response. That's when you get panicked, you get triggered and you stop thinking, you know, it's, it's, it's a more primitive part of the brain. It responds faster, it acts faster. And what happens is when you get stressed, you, you transfer back into the amygdala and it takes over. Uh, the reason that I highly encourage planning is because it's a chance for you to sit down with your prefrontal cortex and do all the planning ahead of time to create um, schedules ahead of time so that you're not running your practice from that fight or flight reactive state. Um, one way to think of it is being in a creative zone versus a reactive zone. Creative, uh, same letters, but creative is using your prefrontal cortex. You are uh, deciding ahead of time how things are going to unfold. The reactive is more, okay, something just happened and I'm really, I'm responding to this in the moment. So what this translates in terms of how to prepare yourself, it means, learning how to plan your time, how to plan your schedule. It's learning how to prioritize. It's learning how to schedule events in your day in a way that makes sense for you. And in particular there, it's a question of planning around your energy. And this is a lovely concept. I didn't learn it till quite late in, in my years, but um, you know, sort of a, a, a simple snapshot of this is that each of us has uh, an internal clock basically and there are moments of the day where we are more productive and there are morning and there are moments of the time where we're less productive so for some of you your best hours might be the first hours in the morning that's me others of you may find that you're most productive in the evening what that means is that when it comes to your scheduling you want to be matching your tasks with your level of energy so in my case and for others who like to who think better in the morning, that would mean putting tasks like legal research, drafting opinions, writing um, difficult uh, opinions or uh, whatever, whatever tasks are more challenging for you, putting those in that time slot and then reserving lower energy uh, time slots for things like checking emails or doing work that is more routine. So that's kind of a snapshot in terms of what energy management involves. Um, other elements of managing your time is negotiating your workflow and, and timelines. So when you have your schedule, you have your plan, when you know what's on your plate and you've forecasted all of that out, when things come up and they land on your desk, you're in a much better position to renegotiate your timelines because you can actually go to the lawyers that you're working with and you can explain what you have on your plate. You can explain what needs to get done and you can go to them, maybe propose some solutions but you're going to want to deal with conflicting deadlines. Um, that's part of communication. That's part of managing your time. Uh, the other piece is recording your time. And this is a whole new practice for most of us. Recording your time is, is a foreign concept when we first start working at a law firm. It can also be quite shocking to see how much you cost. Uh, you know, you go from being a student to being billed out at rates that are going to potentially seem quite high to you. So you may have uh, challenges in terms of not wanting to write down all your time, not wanting to record all your time, feeling worried about that. Um, you may find that it's not a practice that you're very good at sticking to, that you don't do your timesheets every day or whatever time entry system you are using at your law firm. So developing practices at a very early stage about how to keep your time is also a practice that you're going to want to develop from the beginning of your practice. Um, one last thing that I'll mention here in relation to managing your time is procrastination. And this can happen for any number of reasons. It comes up a lot with people who maybe have perfectionistic tendencies where they don't want to 
produce a product that is perfect. And so they spend a lot of time just not doing anything at all. It could be you procrastinate out of overwhelm. You look at a task and you think this is just so big. I've never done this before. You don't know where to begin. And that can kind of freeze you. There's lots of ways that procrastination can come up in a legal practice. Um, if it happens to you, you are not alone. Part of what you want to be thinking about is some useful strategies that you can implement when you find yourself pushing tasks off. Um, I'm going to keep jumping through. Uh, I was going to ask you a question about um, time management questions that you might have, but I think we are better off because um, I want to leave some time for Q&A. So I think we're better off moving through. This next section is uh, practical writing. The issue here is that academic writing and practical writing are not always uh, the same thing. In fact, I'd say they probably aren't the same thing. What will get you an A on a paper in law school may not be the same type of product that's going to um, really move the ball forward in a law practice environment. So um, where does the, where do challenges show up for students and young lawyers when it comes to writing? Um, it can be over emails, right? It can be that you're sitting down, you're trying to write that email and you try, try writing it in five different ways and you just, you know, you're just not happy with it. Um, it may be that you're writing memos and the, the memos aren't quite hitting the mark in terms of what the lawyer that you've just been working with has asked for. Uh, it may be that you are wanting to, you are a strong writer, but you want to know how to take your strengths for academic writing and apply those in a way that is going to be effective in a law firm environment. Um, so uh, the things that you might want to do um, to, to really to, to do that is uh, number one, I've, I've called this next step writing. It's a term that I invented yesterday when I was putting my slides together. But the idea came to me last summer when I was preparing for the writing course. And there's, there's, a, there's a distinction between the writing that you do in an academic context where really the purpose there is you're exploring ideas, it's an intellectual exercise. And then there is this more practical writing where the idea is that the writing that you're using is designed to take somebody to the next step. And I live in the world of coaching. I am always fascinated by the gap that exists between the knowledge piece. So knowing, for example, that you should not procrastinate and the result, which is I will do my work without procrastinating, I'll do it on time. And then there's this gap in the middle and we all know this, we all want this, but there's that delta point. How do you get to that next step? And the same is true when you're writing. When a lawyer comes to you, for example, and asks you to write a research memo, that lawyer is thinking, there's no way I can justify my billing rate to do this research, but I need to know what the research says. I need to know what the law is so that I can advise my clients. So that lawyer comes to you and says, will you please do this memo? Here are the issues that I would like you to research. And the reason that they're coming to you is because they want to have the information that they need to take that next step. That next step for them may be advising their client. So I would invite you to start thinking about your writing as a tool. It's a way of setting up your client, whoever your client might be, to take that next step. And it really is that empowering piece that falls um, that helps people bridge that gap between here's what I here, here's what I know and here's the result that I want, here's how you get there. Other elements of writing um, is tailoring your message to your reader. I'm sure you're all doing that already. You're already thinking about when you have different professors, for example, and you're writing different papers in different courses, you're thinking about their style, you're thinking about how they want what they're asking for. It's the same in a law firm environment. When you're writing to your client, when you're writing for different law lawyers within that same law firm, they may have different ways of writing. And the exercise for you as a lawyer, particularly a young lawyer starting out, is number one, to figure out what the different styles are that maybe you're going to be uh, tailoring your writing to. But also as you, as you evolve as a lawyer, as your practice evolves, is coming up with the style that is your own. And that's, um, that's a really fun evolution for you in terms, of, um, in terms of your growth as a lawyer. 
Another piece is tailoring your style to the medium. So as you know, there are numerous ways for us to all communicate with each other from a simple text message to an email to a uh, letter or a, um, a memo or you know, a factum. There's all these different ways that, that you will be communicating with the external world, whether you're helping to draft submissions that are going to a judge, or if you're helping to draft an opinion letter that's going to the client, you're going to want to know how to customize your writing to, um, to the medium as well as the audience. And finally, uh, what I recommend for students is to develop practices so that they are writing effectively. And there's a couple of things here. Number one is having a plan for how you approach your written work. Um, there is another piece here, which is talking about how you're going to edit your work. And in the course that I offer in the, the summer course, we go into that in quite a bit of detail. We talk about how to have a plan that you can follow to make sure that you're, that you're producing the kind of work that you want to be doing, the kind of writing that you want to be doing, and also how you're going to be reviewing your work from an editing standpoint. And one quick tip that I'd love to offer, which um, is doable if you are managing your time, <laughs> if you have enough time, is writing something and leaving it for a period of time before you submit it. So you probably do that in your law school classes where you're writing a paper. And if you can allow yourself a day or so between the you know, final draft and submitting it, having an opportunity to reread something with fresh eyes is always a good practice. We've got two more uh, of these, two more, two more practices to go. Um, so thank you very much for, for, for following along. I know this is a lot of information all at once. There will be a recording available. So if anything went by too quickly or you want to go back and revisit, you'll have the opportunity to do that. Um, this next piece is effective speaking. This is really, really important. Um, you know, speaking is not just when you're on stage, when you're presenting at a conference, when you're in court. Speaking is going to be an integral part of how you develop your relationships, how you develop trust, uh, how you communicate with the lawyers and other members of your law firm. Um, like I said, I, I, I think I mentioned when I was a younger lawyer, I was quite shy. I found it difficult to speak to lawyers. I found them to be quite intimidating. They were so accomplished. They were so smart. They spoke so quickly using all this eloquent language. And, um, and so I, 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 I think for a lot of us, um, that process can be intimidating. And what is important to learn at a very early stage is that the interactions that you have are opportunities for you to develop those relationships. And I recommend having strategies in place for yourself so that you approach each of those interactions with as much confidence as possible. And I wrote here, know your purpose and have a plan. So having a way of going into those conversations prepared is, is key to communicating confidence. Uh, some ideas there are creating an agenda ahead of time. Are you setting out a clear outline for yourself in terms of what you want to accomplish? Um, when we go back to, you know, we just spoke about writing, having a plan, having a clear outcome in mind, the same holds true for conversations that you're going to be having in person. So do you go into the office knowing ahead of time what it is, that you, what your next step is, or what the next step is that you're seeking for them to decide on? All of this is going to help you uh, become more effective, more confident in the communications that you have with the lawyers and other members of your firm. So finally, we're going to talk about the last element, which is feedback. And I'm just going to, pardon me, just grabbing a glass of water. Uh, so feedback is, um, this is the last pillar. This is an area where students can find it very challenging because they may not be getting, they may not be getting any feedback. They may not understand the feedback, they may get feedback that is, um, you know, constructive feedback that that may, um, 
impact them in a way that they don't really know quite what to do with it. Um, there are a number of things to understand about feedback. So without going into too much detail, we spoke earlier about the, um, the creative and the reactive parts of your brain. And what can happen when you receive uh, feedback is that it will actually activate different parts of your brain. So if it's feedback that is positive, you will actually stimulate um, what they call the rest and digest sort of setting in your body where your creativity is increased, it's enhanced. And that's actually when you will learn and grow. When you receive feedback that is um, quote negative, then that actually stimulates the fight or flight response. And so that's when your amygdala takes over and you can go into this reactive state. If you're getting feedback in the moment, that may um, you know, sort of cause you to, to get thrown off balance. You may have experienced this if you get nervous when you're public speaking, where all of a sudden you find that you're not able to really get your words out correctly. That is because your uh, fight or flight response is taking, taking over. Um, what happens there is that your body wants to conserve all of its energy to basically help you survive. And it means it's taking away energy from the more creative elements of, of, your, of your brain, your ability to learn and process. Another way of thinking about this, I think we've all kind of seen examples of this where there's a plant and there's a light source. And you'll notice the plant will start growing towards the light source. It's the same thing with feedback. We actually grow in the direction of where we're getting that positive feedback. And, um, and conversely, where we're getting that negative, we, we don't grow quite as much. Now, uh, there is a place for all feedback, I think. Um, you know, I, I think too much negative feedback is really not an ideal way to help somebody learn. Really, you wanna be accentuating what is working and building on what is working. But having feedback that um, shows you where maybe you aren't doing things the way that are that is required, when you know that, then you can stop doing that. So I think there really is a place for all types of feedback. And what you want to be thinking about as a student is number one, how you're getting feedback. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second, but also um, how you're taking feedback and how you're learning, how you're using that feedback to, to grow. Um, I mentioned sources of feedback. In a law firm environment, you'll be working with lawyers who are very busy. They may have a culture of being very uh, thorough about giving you feedback in the moment. Uh, I would say the experience of most lawyers that I've worked with is that the feedback isn't always forthcoming. And so you will need to take it upon yourself to actually seek out that feedback and to think about how you're going to seek out that feedback. And there's different ways of doing that. It could be through a conversation. It could be looking at drafts of a document that you worked on to see what was changed. Um, it's a way of, of getting some feedback without actually having a conversation. It's asking yourself how you thought a certain situation went, um, what went well, what could you do better next time. So there's different ways of, of seeking out feedback. And when you have that feedback, then the next step is to really ask yourself how you're going to use that feedback to grow. Um, I gave an example of a couple of questions just now when something happens, what went well, and really dissecting what went well, because you'll want to develop more of that. Um, when something didn't go well, figuring out what you're going to do about it. So that is another area. And, um, and so each of, these, each of these practices put together uh, is, is a framework that I would encourage you to think about as you go into your first uh, law firm experience. Now, um, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes before I turn to the Q&A. And if you do have questions, I, I see there's one in there. I can't actually read it until I unshare my screen. But I would encourage you, if you have questions, to start putting those into the Q&A. Um, I, I would like to talk a bit about a course that I offer for students to help them prepare for their first, well, before and prepare and during their first experience working at a law firm. And it's a course that I started last summer. It's delivered online, it's six weeks long. Each week corresponds to a different topic that we just covered. So the first week is all about expectations. You know, What are the expectations at a law firm? And what are your own personal goals in terms of your um, what you seek to achieve over the course of the summer? How to set goals, how to achieve goals. Um, 
that you know the the professionalism piece uh, we usually talk about that in the first week what does professionalism mean uh, what are the expectations so that's the first week of the course the second week is talking about relationship building so that's when we go deeper into thinking about what you're trying to accomplish you now know your goals what are the relationships that you want to build within your law firm and maybe outside of your law firm that are going to support you in achieving your goals and those might be your shorter term goals but also and but it will also consider your longer term goals um, the third week is talking about time management so that's where we get to do a deep dive in time management which i love and there we're really talking about how to align your time spent with the goals that you set for yourself the third, sorry, the fourth week is all about uh, writing, effective writing. And so we do a deep dive into um, some strategies for effective writing, how to uh, have a plan for your writing and editing, as I mentioned earlier. The fifth week is about speaking. So we talk a lot about how to present yourself with confidence in your law firm, how to deliver your message, how to prepare for those meetings that you have with clients, um, you know, whether it's the clients that you're serving within your law firm or if it's external clients. Um, and then finally, we talk about feedback. So how to seek out opportunities, how to really process that feedback. And we go um, more in depth than what we've done here today. The, the course is online. My plan is to present in this same format using Zoom. Um, it'll be Wednesdays at noon Pacific time, and uh, the first course will be on May 5th. I will also be having two sessions during the six week um, time frame that will be devoted to Q&A. So that will be an opportunity for students to either write in or uh, ahead of time or do, you know, we'll set that more as a meeting. So I, I, I'm imagining we'll have the screen with, with different faces. Um, that you would have an opportunity to, to have some interaction. And all of these uh, re recordings are going to be hosted on the virtual learning platform. And if you look at the, um, the image on the screen, that's just a screenshot from my website, which is um, there's the URL down on the bottom of your screen. The easiest way to get there, I think, is to go to www.uplevelcpd.com and then follow the link to course courses and then to go click into summer bootcamp. Um, the, um, the, the, the course itself is hosted, so all the recordings go into one place. And I also have a number of materials that I will be including for each week. So for each week of the course, there are exercises that you can do, there are some supporting materials that you can do. And the idea there is to create, um, so to give you some, some learning and to give you an opportunity to test out what we're learning within your practice. Um, the price of the course is $200, including GST, and that um, you would pay through the online payment uh, function on the CPD website. Um, for those of you who are interested, and I would love to have you join, um, and if you have questions, then by all means, email me with your questions. I'm, I'm happy to answer them. Um, I would like to offer um, to you, if you register by next Friday, that is April 30th, um, a 30 minute session with me to do one-to-one -one coaching. And that we could do basically anytime over the summer. And that is really helpful. I find with lawyers and with law students where they have that opportunity to work one-to-one it can really be impactful for them. And so I would encourage you to think about that as, as something that would be of additional value to you. And what I encourage you to do there is to come to me with a specific challenge that you're having. It might be something that we are, um, um, sorry, I just a, a comment in the chat. Um, we are, I'm so sorry, I completely lost track. Um, there is a, oh yes, I was just gonna say that you are welcome to come to me with a challenge that you have um, in relation to one of the, one of the problems that you're ch challenges that you're having, and we can talk about that. Um, the question that came into the chat is, I noticed there's also a two-day boot camp option taking place May 1 to 2. Are there any substantive differences between these two? Did you per perhaps not mention because it's full? Um, I, I, I think um, I was initially planning on doing a two-day boot camp. I was not planning to do that. I think the main difference would be that it would be a one to two day uh, course instead of, uh, of a six week course. The main difference would be that um, 
in that type of a format, we wouldn't have the benefit of time between the sessions to, um, to, 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 to test and try and then report back. Um, if that is something that anybody on this call is interested in doing, if you're more interested in doing a boot camp versus a six week version, please send me an email. Um, if there's demand for it, I'd be happy to create it. Um, I, I had initially planned to do that and then I changed my mind. So, um, so if it is of interest to you, please, please let me know and, and we, can, we can set something like that up. Um, for now, the offer is more for the um, six week program um, starting May 5th. So that is all I have to say. I mean, I will also share with you just a couple of comments from some students who took the course last year. Uh, here's, uh, I'll just read some of them out. They're also on the web page uh, that describes the course. Um, and this first comment is really about the unwritten rules piece. So my underlying feedback is your program causes me to think about things that usually go unsaid, things that would easily slip through the cracks and yet are still so critical to mastering the journey. Um, another comment is, I like the aha moments I get once I join all the concepts together. The next is, the course uh, provides you with in-depth information backed by practical examples along with advice and tips. Time management class was my favorite. Um, and then the last one that I'll read here is, the research Paula has done stood out in the resources she provided each week. The breadth of topics covered during the six weeks was so helpful. So um, my experience working with the students was uh, just overwhelmingly positive. It is an honor to be able to support students as they go through that initial transition. And um, so, so yes, um, the, the, the feedback that they have shared is, is, is wonderful. I could share the same feedback about them. Um, it really is a gift to be able to work with students in this capacity. So I'm going to stop my screen share um, I'll, I'll just show you this next slide first. This is my email address. You'll have it. I will send you a link with the, uh, uh, an email with the link to today's recording. So you can always reply to that email if you have questions about the course. Um, and I'm going to stop share. And that will allow me to bring up the Q&A. Okay. So um, the first question here is, could I ask for some concrete examples of how to create those opportunities for organic connection in a virtual setting? I am nervous about striking a balance between inserting myself to create relationships while also respecting the time and energy of the lawyers I'll be interacting with. That is such an excellent question. Um, it is such an excellent question. Um, so some concrete examples of how to create those opportunities for organic connection in a virtual setting. So I think this really starts with, it starts with figuring out who you want to be connecting with. Um, so, so who are the members within your law firm that you want to be speaking with? Is it maybe your mentor? Is it somebody that you're working with? Is it another student that you want to connect with? Is it getting to know your assistant better? Uh, maybe creating a bit of a list for who you want to reach out to. Um, the second thing is to really think about what is true to you. And this is where it's really hard for me to say, this is what you should do. But when it comes to networking of any kind, the, the, the advice that I always give is to do your networking in a way that feels authentic to you. So um, what does uh, an organic opportunity look like? Um, it may be that you are, I mean, for some people, they talk about like a virtual coffee date. I don't know if that's really your thing. Maybe you just want to have a phone call with somebody. Maybe um, if you're working on a file with somebody, it may be saying to them or suggesting, you know, could we have a follow-up chat? I mean, you'd be getting potentially feedback and an organic, organic <laughs> excuse me, an organic connection opportunity at the same time. Maybe you're emailing them to say, hey, you know, I submitted this memo to you last week. I'd love for us to have a chance to connect on that, have some follow-up. I'd love to know, kind of get your feedback on that. Um, if you are, for example, you know, forecasting right now, you're, you know you're going to be going into your law firm, um, maybe it's emailing them and saying, hey, I'd really love a chance to just connect and see how your uh, last few months have been going since we met during the recruitment process. Um, I, I think we... Um, we often don't want to take a step because we don't want to impose 
on people or bother them. And I think in this situation, just the way that things are set up, that that is, I, I would encourage you to find a way to extend invitations where you give that person the option of not doing it potentially, and where you also allow yourself to potentially feel, to be okay with maybe that thing not going ahead. Um, what do I mean by that? Uh, I would not stop yourself from extending an invitation or sending an email or asking somebody to have a short meeting with you um, out of fear that they're not going, that you're going to be imposing on their time. In an environment where everybody is busy, that may be the only way that you are going to be able to make that connection with somebody. So I would accept that as being a risk, but I would also be gentle in the way that you set it up. So you can ask, you know, for that thing to happen, but maybe say, you know, I totally understand if you're too busy for this, but you know, I'd love to have a chance to connect. Would this work for you? Um, some ways of making that um, happen, you could ask them, right? You might say to them, um, if there's something that's going on in a file, you know that there's a call coming up, maybe you know that call's happening and you ask, can I be a participant? Um, I'm happy to do this as a non-billable if that's an issue. Uh, forecasting for yourself opportunities that you see that you would like to take part in. If it's a court hearing, I mean, I haven't been to a court hearing since we went virtual, but I think that um, it's quite easy in a lot of cases just to show up online. So maybe it's saying to them, hey, can you let me know of any court appearances that you have coming up? Because I'd really love to see what that looks like. And maybe the organic opportunity to speak comes after. Maybe you say to them after the hearing, you know, I'd love to have a 15 minute Zoom chat so that we can talk about what happened there, you know? And so it really is being creative on your part, thinking about what your goals are, thinking about the relationships that you're trying to form, thinking about what those organic opportunities might look like and, and coming up with some ideas. It might also be brainstorming with people that you work with. Maybe it's saying, hey, you know, we're gonna be working together as on this file. Um, you know, I understand it's harder to create those organic opportunities. Do you have any ideas on how I might facilitate that for you? So it's really being creative and taking it upon yourself to, um, to, to, to make those things happen. Um, and as long as you're polite about it, I don't think anybody is going to um, take that as an inconvenience. They'll probably be relieved that they don't have to be the ones to come up with all the ideas. Um, the next question, I noticed we're almost at time, so I'm gonna see how many more we, um, I think we'll go for another 10 minutes um, and I'll try to answer all these questions. And thank you everybody for your questions. I love, love, love getting questions during these webinars because it's my opportunity to engage with you. How much should we be revealing about our own nerves to our principal mentors? Will they dislike it if we are insecure at first? Um, that is uh, a question that you're going to really have to weigh in relation to the the relationship you have with your mentor. Um, you have to ask yourself um, whether, how you can express your nervousness in a way that is constructive and empowering as opposed to um, sort of selling yourself short, right? If you show up and say, I'm so nervous, I have no idea what I'm going to do, uh, that sends one message versus, um, you know, this is the first time that I've worked in an environment like this. Uh, I am excited to see what kind of opportunities there are. Do you have any tips on ways to integrate into the law firm? You may feel nervous. I think there's an expectation that you're going to feel nervous, but I would be mindful of the way that you phrase that discussion because what you want to create is um, you want to be thinking about what is the messaging that you're trying to send? And if it was, if I'm in your shoes, uh, if I'm thinking about even today, what is, what is the messaging I'm trying to send? Well, I want to develop uh, trust. I want to um, earn your confidence. I want you to see me as capable. Um, you know, you may be nervous and that's totally okay, but what do you want them to focus on? And, and it's totally fine to feel nervous, everybody does. Um, but what is the messaging that you want to say? And can you, can you, if you think about why would you want to say you're nervous, what are you trying to have them do in response? Can you have that response in a more constructive way? Um, and again, if you're talking about your principles and your mentors, you may have different um, principles. Well, your principle, I think, is really assigned to you um, in, a, in a more formal way. 
you can have informal mentors. So maybe the person that you uh, unload, unload your nervous feelings to, maybe it's not your mentor within your law firm. Maybe it's that you have somebody else who plays a role in supporting you and, um, and you can voice to that person that you really are nervous and that person can help you work through your nervousness. So I, I think you do want to be mindful in that environment of, of what message you're sending out. Um, this next question, if I am unable to attend the sessions live in your upcoming course, am I able to email you with questions about the content if I have them? I think that's a wonderful question and absolutely. Um, I, I think emailing me with questions is a wonderful idea. I can either address them by email, I can address them in the live Q&A sessions, I can address them in the one-to-one -one session. Um, and um, I, I think what I would do there, there's probably also ways of, of, of adding these into the course platform. Um, if you were to ask a question that I thought lots of people would probably want the answer to, maybe I could also, um, I would want to respect your choice to remain anonymous, but I could post the Q&A into a place where it could be accessed by other students as well, potentially. So there's lots of ways for us to do that. Um, I'm happy to have those types of questions come through. Um, another question is, if I'm unable to attend the sessions live in your upcoming course, oh, sorry, I just read that question. Um, okay, how many questions are too many? How long should we spend trying to figure something out before asking for help, especially knowing you are being billed out? So I go through this in the course um, in, in quite a bit of detail. The short answer here, is you wanna have a process. You want to go to your lawyer prepared the first time to have a conversation about the work you're going to be doing on a file. You're going to want to write down all the notes uh, from that conversation. You're going to want to be able to play back to the lawyer exactly what it is that you're expected to deliver. Um, when you get into answering questions, when you get into doing legal research, for example, or writing something, you may start to find that you have more questions that come up as a result of your work. And your job at that point is to re-engage with your lawyer to figure out what all this means, um, where you're going with this. And there are ways of doing that that are again, empowering and there's ways of doing that that are less empowering. So how many questions are you able to ask? Um, I think you can ask as qu many questions as you need to, but you don't wanna ask those questions without having given them some thought beforehand. And that goes to that next question. How long should we spend trying to figure out something before we ask for help? That may be part of the conversation that you have even before you start working on something, right? Like you may be given an assignment. You, that may be one of the questions that you ask them, right? How much time do you expect this is going to take me? And if you start trying to answer that question and you realize that there's no way you can answer the question in the time that they've anticipated, maybe that's when you're going back to ask them the question before, um, before sort of before so you run up a, a large uh, number of billable hours. Um, I also add there that it depends on the lawyer that you're working with. Some lawyers will have much more of an interest in having more conversations with you, whereas other lawyers might be more standoffish. They may be um, wanting you to do more of that legwork, even if it means that you're going to be um, having more billable hours accrue to the file. So um, so that is really a, a combination of having some techniques up your sleeve and being able to exercise your judgment in the moment. So here's a question. Thank you for your webinar. Will your course be helpful for law students starting their career law, their law career in government? Um, I think it would be. And if you have questions about it, by all means, email me. Um, the reason I think it would be helpful is because I've based the course on um, a number of different factors. Some of them are you know, direct feedback that has come from law firms and law students. Uh, another part of it is that it has come from issues that continue to arise among lawyers in their respective practices. And those are lawyers that are not just practicing at law firms, but also in government organizations. Um, and, and, and what I have found, and this is part of the reason why I love this course is that um, it really is setting up practices that are designed to help you as you evolve throughout your career. So initially what you're looking at is understanding the expectations of a law firm, 
But you're, if you're in government, for example, you're going to be looking at what are the expectations in government. When you look at the goals side of that, it's, okay, what are my professional goals? And learning the practice of setting goals for yourself. And whether you're working in government, whether you're working in a law firm, that to me is a skill that you're going to want to be learning. And the reason I think that's so important is because, like I mentioned, when I start working with lawyers who are several years out, who have never gone through this process, um, they can find themselves lost. And, and I've spoken with lawyers who are in government who were many years out, who, um, you know, even close to retirement, who are saying, you know, the conversation that we have where I'm asking them about their goals may be the first time that they've ever even thought about it. So, or that they've been asked that question and they've thought about it in this very intentional manner. So, um, you know, I think timekeeping, having good time management practices applies regardless of where you are. I think learning how to process feedback I think um, learning how to um, learning how to write, learning how to speak, these are all skills that are applicable to anybody really who's who's um, I mean really these are professionalism skills. So absolutely I would say that these are um, that the lessons will be will be helpful to somebody who's starting in government. Um, the next question and thank you thank you everybody for your questions and, and thank you for that question. I think it's really helpful. Um, I've also had students now that we're, we're talking about it, who were not um, who were not already in a law firm, who were uh, I think one L students who wanted to apply for a next round of interviews, and those students also found this course to be really helpful. They um, particularly when it came to preparing themselves for the interview process. So. Uh, I teach this based on the assumption that you are starting your first job at a law firm, but um, there are other groups of students who have found this type of um, course. I also had a number of students last year who were internationally trained lawyers who were preparing for their articles um, who would not have the summer experience. And so for them, it was really useful for them to have this framework that they could then apply when they started their articling positions. Um, for the materials received in the course, will students be able to receive feedback? Um, I'm open to that. If that's something that you think would be useful and helpful, um, I think that we could certainly do that. Uh, I would. I, I, I wasn't planning on doing that um, as, as sort of the default, but certainly if it's something that you think would be helpful, then I'd be open to talking about what that could look like. Do I have any free writing resources? I do not. Um, I think everything that's on my, I have a YouTube channel and there's a number of resources there that talk about interviewing, they talk about networking, um, the, the writing element. I don't have anything that is publicly available and free, um, but um, yes. Um, okay, so there's uh, one more question in the comments field. Do you offer or know of anything similar offered to students starting clerkships in BC? Um, the answer is no. Uh, I think I'm the only person that I know of who's doing this type of work. Um, but if you do have questions about that, then by all means, please feel free to send me an email. I would be delighted to answer any questions that you have. So we are now at um, about 10 past the hour. So we will wrap up today's session. I just wanted to thank all of you for being here today. It has been such a pleasure having you here. If you have any questions, please feel free to send me a note. Thank you again for all your comments. Thank you for your chat. It's been a pleasure connecting with you and I will um, hope to see some of you in the future. Bye for now.